Welcome to the second panel. Um, this has certainly been an amazing weekend for anyone interested in macro and finance. And it looks uh, like we agree on a lot of things, but these are two quite different disciplines. Macroeconomists, I think Luigi mentioned this, they live in econ departments. They build big models with a lot of math. Finance is mostly done in business schools by people who care a lot about institutional details and are obsessing about microeconomic identification. So it, doesn't, it maybe doesn't show always if you look at the program from this weekend, but the, the, these are two different areas. And now we have to deal with this big financial crisis together. So that seems um, like a big challenge. So maybe not, we hadn't done everything we could, and maybe we have to improve. So that's the theme of this whole morning. And uh, if the first panel was focused on what was wrong with macro, maybe now we can uh, go after what might have been wrong with finance a little bit more. It's not just about assigning blame, it's also obviously about thinking, what have we learned and where are we going next? Um, all right. Um, so we have four great panelists for the second session. Kristen Forbes is a professor of management and economics at MIT. She works on capital flows, contagion, international macro, and is and has been very involved with uh, policy, both fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, Ricardo Rice is a professor of economics at LSE, and uh, he works on monetary economics, I think new Keynesian models, and definitely what central banks should and should not do. <laughs> um, Antoine, I'm sorry, that's Sufi, okay, Amir, is a professor of economics at Chicago Booth, although we do claim him for finance. Um, he works on debt markets and has done important work on the Great Recession and the importance of household debt in the U.S. and lately also outside the U.S. Antoine Shore is a professor of finance at MIT and has a very wide uh, impact on empirical corporate finance, entrepreneurship, households, and emerging markets among topics he has covered. Um, so uh, what we're going to start by is letting the panelists have a couple of minutes each for opening remarks, and then uh, battle begins. All right, Kristen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bo, and the organizers, not only for inviting me here for this stimulating weekend, but also tasking us with this panel of thinking through what we've talked about the last two days, summarizing it, what we learned, what we missed, and what we still need to do. It's a good exercise, maybe not last night, but um, it's something I encourage all of you to do as you wait in lines in airports or head back. Think through what you've learned and what's missing. And I think that hopefully there are many bright minds in this group. This will stimulate the next round of research. Um, but taking a step back from today, looking back to 2008, right as the crisis was unwinding, Queen Elizabeth went to the LSC to get a briefing on economics and try to learn what happened. And supposedly she said, this is terrible. How did you miss this? Or something along those lines. And you know, she was, it, that was an, uh, a fair criticism. Why didn't we see this coming? Uh, why didn't we as macroeconomists? This is a criticism I hope we've all taken to heart. And one thing that I took from the last couple days is we have taken this to heart. The, the crisis has significantly affected how the fields of macro and finance and international are thinking about issues. It's forced people to tackle whole new areas that were not a focus. It's forced people to dig out things some of which were done before but hadn't received the right attention or hadn't been taken that step forward. So I think the good news from the last couple of days is we really have pushed our thinking. We did now have advanced our thinking on issues such as the plumbing of financial markets. Um, how do these markets work at the micro level and trading work so that they can freeze up and stop working at points in time? We really have pushed our thinking on financial intermediation and the role of leverage in financial intermediaries and how they can introduce vulnerabilities into the system. We've also done quite a bit of work on debt and credit cycles and the vulnerabilities that that can introduce. So we have made progress. I think we really have refocused re, um, much of the work in macro and finance. So that's good. That's a good start, and that's the first step. But I also left a bit um, depressed, I'm not sure if depressed is the quite word, but frustrated that we have only taken this first step. 
we haven't gone to that next step of what do we do about it. Um, it was actually quite striking how little discussion there was taking the results that we have made and the advances we have made to then something concrete about how we take these lessons and stop another crisis from happening in the future. Um, I mean, to be fair, we can't start to talk about what to do and how to stop this from happening until first we better understand what went wrong. So that's a good place to start. We need to dig in and better understand what went wrong. And I think we do have a pretty good sense now. You know, we haven't filled in all the pieces and all the holes. There's more work to be done. But I think we do have, after the, what we've talked about the last couple of days, a pretty good sense of where the different pieces were, where things went wrong, and how they interacted, and how things got amplified. So we've now got a pretty good sense of what went wrong. And what came, clearly came out of that is that part of the solution, so this doesn't have to happen again, is macroprudential regulation. We do need to shift from thinking about monetary policy, independent central banks, the inflation target, and keep price stability combined with microprudential regulation that focuses on risks in individual institutions. That's all important. That's a good step. But we also need to lay on top of that some sort of macroprudential regulation that looks at risks in the entire system. We need to think more carefully about the overall buildup of credit risk and aggregation of risk in the whole system, not just individual institutions. We need some sort of institution looking at how risk can be amplified and spread through markets, through liquidity, and especially through systemically important institutions. So the research we've had has shown that these were important vulnerabilities. We weren't thinking about these macroprudential risks before. We need to think about these in the future to stop this from happening again. That came clearly from the research. But that's sort of then where the research stopped. Um, it was actually quite, a number of people did mention at the end of presentations the last couple of days, so this implies we need macroprudential regulation. And that was usually where they ran out of time and skipped over that and went on. <laughs> and that makes sense because macroprudential regulation, it's hard. It's not something you can quickly summarize in a minute or two. Exactly how you do it, how you address the risks. You know, big picture in a model, it's sometimes easy. And there has been some progress in some of the modeling. You put on a tax towel that's your macroprudential regulation, it's all fixed. But in the real world, it's a lot harder than that. Um, there was some discussion, to be fair, about increasing capital, regula or capital requirements, but that discussion was also somewhat frustrating in the complete lack of agreement on how much. You know, do you increase some capital requirements by 4% or 40%? You know, there's a pretty big range we're talking about, so that's not um, terribly helpful. We did have some of the actually most discussion on policy responses was on thinking about debt forgiveness after the crisis hits, which I'm counting on you to talk about, so I won't say anything more. I think that's an important discussion, but that's a different set of policy responses. That's after the crisis hits, how you ameliorate some of the responses. I think we need to shift and really focus on stopping the next crisis first. You know, we also need to think about how to respond, but let's first try to stop another one from happening soon. Um, I think uh, Olivier Blanchard gave a very nice discussion yesterday where he talked about the stages of the crisis, and he ended with one of the more complete descriptions of what we need to do. He actually hit two sentences that he actually read and got to, unlike most others who skipped over them. And his solution was, we clearly need macroprudential regulation, and I quote, to decrease multipliers in the probability of multiple equilibrium at each level. Yes, I think we can all agree on that. But now imagine you're a policymaker. The president calls you into his office, and now just so it's not quite so easy to laugh at this, let's pretend you're not going to President Trump. You're going to, um, let's say you're going to President Bartlett, for those of you who watch The West Wing. He's actually trained in economics, so, so we're making this a harder bar. You're going into President Bartlett, and he says, I don't want another crisis to happen on my watch. What do we do based on all this research? So you'd say, okay, we need to increase capital requir or requirements somewhere between 4 and 40%. Um, when the crisis hits, we can forgive some debt, but that, you know, that doesn't sound too great. Um, or we can uh, decrease multipliers in the probability of multiple equilibrium at every level. You know, you're probably not going to keep your job if that's the, uh, the level of the advice. We need to go a step further and be more concrete and know more what we recommend to address these problems. Um, as Gary Gordon said yesterday, there are key issues in the models that might make sense to just stop reduce credit, reduce debt, cut all these channels out, but that's obviously not practical either. There are benefits to some financial liberalization, to credit, to leverage. You know, the question is, what's the right level? What's the right trade-off? These are hard questions. And what makes this even harder, even if we knew what the right levels are, which is a, we are not anywhere near that yet, 
Um, the little bit of research that is starting to be done on macroprudential regulations suggests they are not straightforward, and that's even ignoring what the right level is. Uh, the research that is out there suggests that there often are unintended consequences, externalities, and spillovers that are not immediately the, uh, on mind and that we don't think about when we think about the models or think about applying these regulations. And it's also dangerous because people who, policymakers who might have a very narrow focus who think, I'll put on this macroprudential regulation, they might focus on whether that regulation works on that very narrow goal they have, they miss some of these broader unintended consequences, which could actually be shifting risk to other sectors of the economy and creating more problems in the future. And let me just give you a couple examples from the little bit of research which is starting to emerge on macroprudential regulations. So there's been some where there's probably been the most research is on the work uh, impact of higher capital requirements, some very good work being done at the Bank of England. And some of these authors have clearly shown put on capital, higher capital crime rates that does reduce bank lending. So first order, it works. But then you do get increased lending by foreign banks in the country, banks which you may have less regulation of, less oversight. Um, and it's some work that I've done with colleagues at the Bank of England and the um, Bank of Canada, we looked at the impact of FX regulations. So in many emerging markets where exposure to foreign currency is one of the big macro prudential risks, which they've been more aggressively um, trying to reduce risks of, countries are putting on limits on bank borrowing in foreign currency. Makes a lot of sense, seems obvious. Our research suggests they do work. Banks do reduce their borrowing in foreign currency and lending in foreign currency, so it might be tempting to stop there. But then what we also do in our research is we take it to the next level. We say, what are some of the other effects? And we find there's a very significant shifting where companies that no longer have access to cheap um, borrowing and lending in FX from the banks, they start to issue debt in FX to international investors. So now you're seeing a shifting of exposure to foreign currency, a very important risk in many countries, out of the banks into individual corporations. So that might be good because you're taking some of the risks out of the banking system, which is systemic and is important. But then you have this risk in individual companies that may have less uh, expertise on how to handle these risks. They may be less well hedged. And these are sectors that are not well regulated. So you don't know the extent of the risks building up. So it's not so clear. Macroprudential regulations look like they work at the first pass. But there are some pretty important unintended consequences that need to be part of the conversation. Um, there's also some very nice work showing how regulations in one country have spillovers to other countries. Um, a clear example from some other work I've done on capital controls, um, a number of countries have put on capital controls to limit capital inflows, which are correlated with the buildup of leverage and credit and all the problems we've been talking about the last few days. So when countries put on capital controls, such as Brazil put on a tax on capital inflows that did reduce capital inflows to Brazil, but then some of those inflows, um, portfolio investors shifted their portfolio they put less money in Brazil, put more money in other small emerging markets that could accomplish some of the same goals they were trying to get from investing in Brazil. So we called it a bubble thy neighbor effect. Brazil might have reduced their risk of bubbles, but it might have shifted that bubble to other countries. So these are the, just a couple, oh, one other example, since we're in Sweden, the Riksbank has a nice paper where they look at uh, LTV limits, loan to value limits on mortgages, popular macroprudential regulation that's getting a lot of attention. They find it does accomplish the direct goal. It does reduce some of the mortgage lending, but then they saw simultaneously an increase in unsecured lending. Is that a good outcome or not? Is that actually increase the risks that now you have more loans that are unsecured instead of at least backed by property, albeit with risks there? So I mean, that's just a very short summary of a couple of papers, but it does highlight um, moving from saying, oh, we just need to do macroprudential regulation to having something concrete that we understand is a big step. And that's where I think there is a big gap in the academic work and where I encourage, especially any students in the room, to think about doing more. Um, now that we have a better understanding of the crisis, we can hopefully move to thinking about how we address it. And that means thinking the same way we're hopefully thinking more, not just about small individual channels, but broader implications spillovers, um, broader effects on the broader financial system. So the bottom line is, I hope that when Queen Elizabeth is back, and she may be here in another decade or whenever the next crisis hits, she seems ageless. But I hope, I really hope that when that next crisis comes, whenever it is, it will come. But I really hope that the question she asks is not, um, not did you see it coming, but I hope the question she asks is, if you saw it coming, why didn't you do more about it? That's where we have to do more. Ricardo. Uh, 
Okay, well, thank you very much for having here. It's really a pleasure, and, and I've learned an enormous amount in the last couple of days, thanks to most of the people here in the audience. Um, as you saw already yesterday in the panel, and certainly uh, yesterday in the sessions, as well as partly in the first panel today, macro is a big, heterogeneous, thankfully, I think, but not so thankfully, fierce and feisty and, and uh, infighting <laughs> gang of people, if you want. Um, and my, my task here was to say, how does this macro uh, relate to finance and how do they contribute to each other and perhaps what can macro offer to finance in terms of some insights um, that I think we've achieved. But I would start with the fact that, perhaps the very obvious fact, that 20 years ago, a very small part of macroeconomists, a small group of macroeconomists, who had indeed been fighting about the cause of business cycles and been fiery in debates and others, um, had to agree on a name for their, what seemed to be their converging research agenda, and they used this name, DSGE, which was a great name because it meant nothing insofar as all of macro was dynamic, stochastic, and had general equilibrium <laughs> in terms of what modern macro is in many ways. Um, but that immediately shows you that the links between macro and finance are obvious insofar as what is finance if not about transferring resources over time, dynamic, and thinking about transferring resources across states that is stochastic. So the division between macro and finance as anyone who has, um, I think, learned them and spend some time in two camps is that it's often very often the same equation but all the changes what you put on the left hand side and what the right hand side but they're very much similar equations and so to talk about the integration between them it's certainly something that I always thought were, were already very integrated in that sense. Um, now having said so um, uh, there are some fields where the integration I think is particularly clear and where um, the links between macro and finance are uh, very deep in ways that sometimes are not sufficiently appreciated. And one of them is monetary economics. Um, there's a side of monetary economics, a more if you want philosophical side, which has spent a lot of time worrying about why there's money and what are the functions of money. And the starting point of a lot of that is that money is a store of value. As such, it has a return and has some risk. Um, and that is very, as, likewise, it is money is ultimately theories of money have to deal with how safe money is as that sort of value and I've talked about its liquidity in the sense of how much you can use that money. So the central topics of finance are classic macro topics in that monetary sense and if anything actually studying money I think as we struggle to understand risk, return, liquidity and safety going back to how we've struggled very hard to understand what money is often offers very deep insights precisely because money is such a simple asset. There's no control rights, it's information insensitive. Um, it allows you to run on the money when you wanna run on your government in terms of that discipline device on government policies. Um, and so its liquidity is very clear, it's defined as the medium of exchange. And so understanding that field of monetary economics, I think, uh, I think many finance people find it very rewarding when they go and read monetary economics that they learn that a lot of concepts actually become clear, uh, I think, in useful ways. On the more applied side of monetary economics, um, it is very much dominated, as we learned in the last panel yesterday, through Mike Woodford's presentation and Amy Nakamura's discussion, is very much about setting interest rates, um, the interest rate on the deposit of the central bank as being the tool, and in doing so, inducing agents to borrow more or lend more, or to go more into safe investments or risk investments, and in doing so, affect what real outcomes are. These are, of course, again, very important financial decisions, and to think especially, and I think what what this, the work in monetary economics shows is that thinking about not just redistribution between borrowers and lenders and who wins or loses, but thinking about how as an aggregate the financial system facilitates these trades and how by changing this tiny little interest rate on deposits are this tiny asset and certainly where deposit and how that spreads across the economy, I think has enormous lessons for finance in terms of where arbitrage is limited and is not limited and others of that type. Now in the last 10 years, um, I think monetary economics has become much more exciting in many ways because there's been a new consideration, which is the central bank balance sheet. Central bank balance sheet used to be very boring. The central bank issued a durable good, again, money that people like to use. I don't know, people like Ferraris, people like pictures of paper with a queen on them. <laughs> issued some durable good and used the proceeds from that to retire government debt. And so there was really no balance sheet. And indeed, the Fed talked about factors affecting the flow of funds as opposed to a balance sheet per se. Um, since then, like, the balance sheet has looked a lot more like a bank. In many ways, central bank was a bit of, mis of, mis of a misnomer. Uh, in many countries, even called them monetary authorities instead. Um, but in the last 10 years, they've really become more like banks in the sense that, and very familiar, I think, to people coming from finance, that there's now liabilities. 
Those liabilities are deposits of banks in the central bank, sometimes called reserves, uh, and they have grown an enormous amount. Now currency is, a, the durable good is a very small part relative to the liabilities, the sales if you want. Uh, second, the assets have become very varied in terms of their risk profiles and maturity profiles. Third, there's, become, there's now a short, long mismatch in this balance sheet because reserves are overnight and investments have gone into 10 and 20 year bonds at times. So in many ways, the central bank balance sheet looks very similar to that of a bank engaging in maturity transformation. I think it looks very familiar to finance, to finance economists. Um, fourth, the dividend stream of the central bank, which used to be extremely steady, is now quite volatile. It's grown a lot with the crisis. It's going to go down now. And the, you start having to think about how that dividend stream interacts with fiscal authorities and what they want from it. Fifth, the central bank can go insolvent now. I mean, it always could, but now it can go insolvent in the sense that if, if banks don't, if at some point the central bank, central bank, whatever it makes positive income, it has to rebate it to the, to the fiscal authority. When it makes negative income, there's no mechanism to recapitalize it, and as such has to just issue more reserves. As a result, reserves of, the central, of banks of the central bank can quickly become Ponzi schemes, and in such, banks refuse to roll it over often by, for instance, dollarizing, but in that sense becoming insolvent, now that we have abundant reserves in a way that we didn't before. Um, and sixth, that the fundamental profit of the central bank, selling cars, sorry, issuing print, <laughs> piece of paper, generates a revenue called seniorage, which has become, like in many corporations, something that is subject to long-run technological change as people want less and less pieces of paper, and which has fluctuated more in many regards. So in this sense, that part of market economics has looked a lot more like finance. But what I think macroeconomists can offer to finance researchers is to say that in all of these six features that I pointed to, looking at the central bank as if it was a bank can really lead you astray in terms of the consequence of what these things are. For first, the reserves, the deposit central bank, the liabilities, are extremely elastic. They can be increased in an enormous amount in a way that no corporation can, as we saw in the data in 2000, between 2008 and 2011. That's a very specific power of a central bank. That, that other, other banks don't have. Second, when looking at the assets, yes, they are risky, but they're for the most part issued by the government, who's of course the spouse of the central bank, and so to what extent do we think about what that risk means, if all I'm doing is buying risky assets that my wife issues? And again, monetary economists, I think, have thought somewhat, I think, deeply about some of these issues, which are difficult. Third, Yes, there's a short, long mismatch, but of course, as a central bank, you do have some influence on the slope of the yield curve. So unlike other banks, you do have some control on how much of a profit or loss you're going to make and how certainly to time it over time. Fourth, the dividend streams, unlike in corporations or in banks, are essentially what defines the independence of the central bank. It's its ability to, or to what extent it has fiscal backing is the word we use in monetary economics, is to what extent you can fluctuate your dividend without changing your policy insofar as the dividend streams do not give the government, if you want, control rights or shareholder rights over the central bank, i.e. central bank independence, is very different from the dividend streams that go to shareholders and corporations. Fifth, that insolvency of the central bank does not mean bankruptcy court. It means instead that, as in any economic agents, insolvency means your liabilities are worthless. Well, nobody wants to roll them over. Well, since the price of the liabilities of the central bank, since, sorry, since the nominal price of the liabilities of the central bank is one, the unit of account, insolvency means one over p goes to infinity. The price, oh, sorry, one over p goes to zero, that is the price level goes to infinity. So insolvent central bank is very different in terms of its macro implications and what it means. It's really insolvency is a synonym for hyperinflation when it comes to central bank. And finally, six, when we think about seniorage, well, that revenue fluctuates like in a corporation. The fluctuations of that revenue are very tightly associated with what happens to inflation, which of course comes with very big externalities, if you want, on the payouts of, bond, of uh, borrowers in the economy, chiefly of which is the government, which means that it's not when the central bank is affecting its revenue, it's not just affecting its, but that of other big government players, not a lot of others. What is the common theme, and I'll stop here before then we start discussing other things, is that uh, the central bank is, what's missing, I start with a D and the S, which finance absolutely has and has much more development ways than finance. What, it, but what I think macro has done quite well is the GE, again, thought about in as general sense of the aggregates, and the central bank is precisely a bank that is a big player, that interacts with the markets, that interacts with other policymakers, and I think those perspectives are very important, that if one just goes to central bank from a pure finance perspective, you can get really wrong in terms of understanding how the liability, asset, and dividend matches work. Amir? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Bo, and I want to thank the organizing committee 
um, what a great conference. Uh, it's been fantastic. For me, as I'm looking around the room, uh, when I was at MIT, uh, I took Jeremy Stein's corporate finance class, which got me interested in corporate finance. Uh, I was lucky enough, Mark Gertler was actually on leave at MIT, so I got to learn some macro from Mark Gertler. And I think I'm one of the few students that actually got to take three classes with Bengt Holmstrom. Um, and I'm not even a theorist, so uh, it was really fantastic. And, and obviously Antoinette was one of my advisors. So uh, for me, it's just to be here and to see all these people and to be able to present in, in front of you, it's, it's just a real honor. So, and, and I think you guys deserve a lot of credit for bringing this crowd together. Um, so Nancy said something in the last panel that I thought w was perfect for me, and that is, how many people out there are working at the intersection of finance and really thinking about how finance affects the real economy? And as we finance people sit up here and we criticize macro, I, one quote I always love is, you know, you find the fault in others that have become hidden in yourself. And so in some degree, like, are we in finance really thinking seriously about the real economy? And that's what we, and when I say we, I mean Atif Mian and I, we've been trying to do in our research. And so the one thing I wanted to talk about in the opening, and I have a lot of other thoughts uh, as well in terms of policy and in terms of thinking about central banking, is just what has been the traditional view of the impact of the financial sector on the real economy, and how has that changed over the last 10, 15 years? I think the traditional view was that long-term development, long-term growth, in order to get it in a country, you needed a really solid financial system. That financial development was really good for long-term growth. It's kind of the good finance view. And I don't think we want to lose sight of that. There's a lot of evidence to support that view. Countries that have better developed financial systems have better outcomes in the long run. But I think what we've learned over the last 10 years on the research side is really that the financial sector can be a serious source of instability uh, when it comes to the real economy. And that's really what I'm most interested in in my research. Now, this idea, of course, isn't new. Um, anyone who's read Charles Kindleberger or Hyman Minsky knows people have been thinking about this for a long time. But we've made just tremendous headway, I think, on the research side, both on the empirical side and on the theory side, to try to understand why the financial sector may be a source of instability. So yesterday we saw these great presentations by John John Akopoulos and Andre Schleifer, uh, who are two people's research I read uh, very closely to think about my own empirical research where Andre's talking about belief fluctuations, that how they can generate endogenous boom-bust cycles. John's talking about leverage. And then on the empirical side, we saw Ken and Carmen's just fantastic research on financial crises along with Alan Taylor. And what we're learning from that research, especially on the empirical side, is that these large booms in credit really do have systematic predictive power in predicting both financial crises and declines in growth. And that predictability is something that really is kind of a puzzle that I think we need to think about, but we do have some ways of going there with the, with the theory models that we have. Now, um, let me just tell you the basic argument that we've made and then maybe flesh it out a little bit. But the basic argument we make is that there's these things that we call credit supply expansions. And what do we mean by that? We just mean situations in which there are financial excesses in the financial system, and as a result, banks and the financial system decide that they're more willing to lend, even though there's no real fundamental change in the productivity or the income potential of the borrowers. That might happen because of beliefs of lenders. Antoinette has done great research on this. It may happen because of financial liberalization. I've studied a decent amount the Scandinavian experience in the 1980s, which looking at the crowd, I don't know how many people are young enough to remember that. Um, but in terms of uh, thinking about something to put some, some flesh on these bones, if you want to think about that as an example, and that these credit supply expansions tend to systematically predict three to six years later crashes in the economy. And that's kind of something that we need to think about and why that happens. The thing that we've been thinking about most recently, which is really puzzling us, is where do these things come from? Why all of a sudden? You know, it's kind of interesting. If you think about the way the day was structured, the last, you know, yesterday and the day before, it's like we start at the end. There's a financial crisis. It affects the real economy. I think that's totally obvious, at least on the finance side. That, that's, there's no dispute about that. You know, maybe there is in the macro community. No dispute about that. Finance. We know the crisis affects the real economy. But then we say, well, what caused the crisis? 
And that's where, you know, Atif and I and others come in. We say, well, look, there's these big debt burdens that come in credit supply expansion. But the question, where do these credit supply expansions come from? And I think that's the question that we're still mulling over. So we've been promoting this idea of just any shock that leads to a rapid influx of capital into the financial system. So Ben Bernanke's global savings glut is one example of this. Liberalization in some country that leads to capital inflows. The international open economy economists have been thinking about this for a while because they've seen this all the time. But I think for advanced economies, it's a little bit trickier. And one of the ideas that we're exploring in some recent research is how income inequality may be related to these credit supply expansions. And when you start thinking about income inequality, that hasn't been such a short-term phenomenon. That's not a cyclical phenomenon, but instead that's a very long-term issue. And there's a striking pattern in the data if you look since about the 1980s, we've seen a rapid rise in income inequality. What have we also seen? We've seen rapid increases in household debt to GDP ratios in just about every country. Alan Taylor shows this in re his research so convincingly. There's just this hockey stick. And then we, what else do we see? We see very low interest rates over time. And we think these things are connected. Just think about it. If there's more income inequality, the top 1% is making a lot more money. What are they going to do with that money? At the end of the day, how many yachts can Bill Gates really buy, right? So more and more of that money finds its way into the financial system. Where is that money going to go? Well, we wish it would go towards productive investment. That's what we want the financial sector to do, and hopefully it can do that. But, you know, somehow it starts to leak into subprime mortgages, into, you know, subprime auto loans, into maybe buying some Turkish debt and U.S. dollar denominated. Um, so we need to think a little bit about what's going on in the broader economy. And the last thing I'll say is to bring it back to Sweden itself. So we had this kind of funny thing that I, I'll, I'll take the blame for, where Atif showed in his presentation. We were looking, you know, anytime I come to a country, I want to learn a little bit about its economy. I was here three years ago. And literally, the Riksbank, three days before we came, basically said that household, rising household debt levels were the biggest threat to the to Swedish economy, which Lars Svensson definitely pushed back on. So I think <laughs> there's been some debates between Lars and the Riksbank. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but, uh, so, so, but in any case, if you look, what are mortgage interest rates in this country? They're shocking. They're like 2%. And you see house price to income ratios just skyrocketing and household debt levels skyrocketing. And I'm not sitting here going to say there's a cyclical risk of a crash, but there seems to be some long run fundamental thing going on that moves us beyond just thinking about cyclical factors. And I think we need to think about a 20 to 30 year, year horizon to think a little bit about what's going on. Thank you. Antoinette. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me. It's been indeed, as everybody has said, um, a really wonderful um, experience to be here. Um, now, I'm the last person on this panel, and uh, I actually predicted that uh, Ama would uh, basically set the stage for some of the things I want to say, so hopefully I can be um, very quick. Um, because I also want to echo um, this idea that, you know, if you think about what is finance, right? Finance ultimately is about trying to predict the future. Um, it's basically um, trying to design financial instruments, financial markets that tell us how to invest and how to value assets. That is about predicting the future, at least trying to, which we often don't do so well, which then right, leads to mistakes and to risks. But of course, it means that centrally, one of the things I think that we have now learned in finance maybe for a bit longer in macro, I think, especially since the crisis, is that thinking about how people form those beliefs and how sometimes they can go wrong and how it, looking at financial instruments and then updating right, affects um, how the economy and how financial players um, act in this economy. And so, um, because you know, I thought all my, my pre-panelists would, would set the stage. I just want to focus right on one small part of the financial crisis or the lead up to the financial crisis that I have worked on and that actually makes that point, also the point um, that Ama just made, which is you know, we see this massive expansion um, in household debt um, over the period before the financial crisis, starting actually from the mid-90s, right, and then really accelerating in the 2000s. Um, the point that I want to make in that, you know, we have made um, in, in research that I've done with my co-authors co um, 
um, Adelino and, and Severino, is that actually the, one of the things that we actually are learning, right, and that we have learned is one of the biggest misnomers of this financial crisis is that it was called a subprime crisis. And actually, I feel it has a lot to do with this shifting view um, that Ama was also um, just explaining of how we think about the drivers in finance. So if you think right very early on in the crisis, the idea was all about um, you know, moral hazard, fraud, mistakes, uh, I mean, sorry, um, misaligned incentives that banks had in origination. And that's obviously a very important part in finance and economics in general that we've been thinking about for a long time. So this is kind of the go-to, right? And this is where the idea of, oh, this was all subprime came from. But then our research actually showed that um, that is not the entire story. There was, of course, an expansion in subprime debt, but there was, in particular, an expansion in prime debt and debt to the middle class, to high FICO people. And because these are the rich people, right, they take on bigger mortgages, and so much more debt piled up in this part. In fact, what's even more stunning, so, you know, as an economist, then I would say debt to income, right, went up across the economy, and this is CLTV, so including, you know, kind of all the secondary uh, mortgage debt instruments. But interestingly, you see at the same time, actually, that the LTV, so the, you know, kind of loan to value, stayed flat. Actually, so what I mean with this, the distribution of loan to value didn't change from 2000 to 2007. That's actually stunning, right? Because this is telling you that it's almost like passively banks and maybe borrowers, right, borrowed against the increasing value. So it's not so much that there was a dislocation where capital flew to, you know, really, um, you know, the, the worst borrowers, but everybody seemed to be levering up. In fact, one stunning fact is that if you look over the crisis period, um, ownership of poor people actually went down, which again highlights actually, or you know, confirms something that Amma was saying before, right? <coughs> this tells you somehow that this crisis um, aggravated income inequality, right? It, it seemed, to, it's not so much that, oh, the banks made a mistake by lending to people who didn't have the income stream um, to ever even afford a loan. These people dropped out long ago. Um, what we are seeing is that in the middle class, right, against these increasing house values, banks seem to have believed they can be sustainable or they can go up forever, and households seem to have also embraced this because you see a massive churning, an increase in the speed of buying and selling of houses, which, right, of course, banks have to facilitate this, but households also have to be willing to do this. Um, on top of it, right, we see actually that much more speculation is happening. Um, for example, some work by, sorry, by Neil Buda, by Ama and Artif recently shows that actually speculation also, meaning housing speculation, um, contributed um, to this um, to this phenomenon of ever um, increasing um, leverage through housing. Now, why, however, so let me finish by saying. Why is it so important that we get it right in terms of where these increases come from? Because if you look at the Dodd-Frank Act, for example, and a lot of the regulation post-2008 is all around um, preventing banks from lending to subprime, um, lending to these quote-unquote unsustainable marginal borrowers, which, however, our research shows really were not the, cr the, the crux of the crisis. In fact, Ben Vernanke had some very interesting research that he showed um, yesterday, um, where he actually suggests that it, the, the subprime wasn't even the catalyst, or you, know, you could say the small spark that broke the back. In fact, um, his research seemed to suggest that, that you know, kind of even the securitized subprime tranches went down long before, and the market didn't respond so much um, to this. It was just, you know, once Lehman and other banks failed and there was a panic. So let me come back. Right, finally, I want to say, so why is this important? Because we need to, um, as, as Kristen also said, we need to um, regulate against or for the right things. And so the final point I want to make, which actually came up a bit yesterday and the day before, is I feel what we do not have yet and this is really where macro can help us a lot, is we don't know how to measure the, the foregone cost of regulation um, for and against crisis. So what do I mean with this is the following. Um, so what has happened in the US, if you look? 
um, the, the regulation um, has pushed actually banks away from lending to retail um, mortgage. So what we have now is a huge displacement where actually the type of regulation we have, we have means that almost no uh, regulated bank is lending to retail uh, borrowers in the market, mortgage market and all of, most of this is now done by entities like Quicken, um, Fintechs that are very thinly capitalized. Um, and if we don't measure those impacts and take them into account, right, we might end up with consequences that we really might not want. And so I feel the, the, where macro really can help us here is actually that by helping us to model how these regulations more broadly affect the general equilibrium, we then can hopefully also measure the impact it has on the wider economy. Um, it's like, you know, this very unfortunate um, comment that you very often got, get if you go to deve developing countries. After 2008, when I went to India, uh, where I do a lot of research, right, a lot of people would say to me, you see, um, this is why the Indian financial market is so much better than the US. We don't have a crisis. And I would tell them, you have a crisis every day when a mother cannot borrow against her house um, and her kid is dying because she cannot get, um, you know, kind of say, uh, medicine, right? So those are the kind of things which I feel we need to measure much better to then help central banks and, and the economy um, to improve the trade-offs and the cost-benefit tra trade-offs um, in regulation. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any comments you want to uh, respond or react or reflect on anything? All right. So uh, one thing I hope we could talk about a little bit is what have we learned? I think some of you have touched on this, but compared to where we were in 2008, what do we know now that we didn't know now? Have there been surprises here in terms of knowledge development and so on? So, so one thing that, that um, I think that is, and I, and I, you know, before 2007, 8, when I started working with Atif, most of my research when I was thinking about how the financial sector affected the real economy was focused on firms. I think most, I mean, it's called corporate finance for a reason, right? I think most of us thought that the primary way in which the financial sector interacted with the real economy was through the firm sector. Uh, and I think since then, we've started to realize, well, you know, and it's kind of obvious once you start thinking about housing is a huge part of almost every, especially in advanced economies, just the housing market and the mortgages associated with the housing market are a huge fraction. You know, in the U.S. in 2007, in fact, half of all private debt outstanding was household debt, and you know, basically 90 percent, or about 75 to 80 percent of that was mortgage debt. And so, I think there's been an entirely new class of models which are modeling the interactions between the financial sector and the real economy by focusing on the housing sector and the household sector and mortgages. As Kristen was mentioning, central banks have taken the lead on this. The United Kingdom, the Bank of England has imposed LT or DTI constraints. Uh, I saw that the Swedish Riksbank has also done some macroprudential regulation on very high debt to income mortgages. Um, and so there is a more of a focus, I think, on the household sector uh, and it kind of makes sense once you start to look at the aggregate facts. Real estate is just such a huge part of most economies, uh, most advanced economies' financial system. Ricardo? So, so let me separate that uh, into what I think we knew but hadn't paid enough attention to and uh, some, I think, very new things that we learned. But I think one that we knew, and I want to shift a little bit discussion, following a bit on something Luigi said, which is there's been a lot of emphasis on how the GSEs work in the U.S. or not. So there's a certain U.S. bias sometimes in this, and that came up also yesterday. I mean, we had a very big crisis in the Eurozone that is not just a consequence of the U.S. financial crisis. I mean, the crisis in Europe from 2010 to 12 is not the financial crisis of 2008 and 2010. Those are just separate things, and there's shocks, their mechanisms, their amplifications in many ways. And I don't think we spoke enough about it yesterday, so I'll do it now for two minutes or three, uh, which is, I think, I can explain it why I think there was a big mistake of a lot of macroeconomists, not all, but many, who looked at the euro crisis as, I know about this as optimal currency areas, fixed exchange rates, which was a big distraction in actually in terms of what was going on and in terms of floating or fixed, when instead it was a lot of other concepts that, I, that we knew in other, but we weren't really applying correctly. Things like uh, that the capital account is as or more important than the current account, if you want, in the sense the gross flow of assets 
and how having Germany run an enormous surplus and Spain an enormous deficit with an enormous amount of transformation of assets between the two was something that was creating a lot of fragility. Um, it was how can a bank or how can a capital union work when you don't have a European safe asset, which implies that you're going to have banks that always have very risky government bonds, as well as the fact that any flights to safety come with current account adjustments because the flight safeties are geographic, unlike in the US where they're across asset classes but have less of a geographic component. The fact that um, deposit insurance um, guaranteed by the government, when you think at the macro level and you leave this, the finance models, so if you think about Diamond Divic and others, well, it only works if you have the fiscal space to guarantee it. and if you have enormous banks, that's really not going to work. And, and if those banks have spillovers across borders, you really have to think about runs in a different way or in, in, in more of a way that I think with Diamond and Divic we knew about runs, but the, it required using that knowledge and going further, uh, which is quite different from run on repo, for instance, which is a different application Diamond and Divic. So these are things where I think we knew, or even, sorry, to conclude all, to, as a final point also, the link between sovereigns and banks, the diabolic or doom loop that Emmanuel has worked on. These are all things that my colleagues in international macro some knew, uh, and they didn't know just from the southern hemisphere, which is far away, even from Scandinavia. Some of these things were there, in I think we already knew them, but we hadn't really put them together. We got distracted with the fixed exchange rate, and I think that's something that thankfully is getting a lot more attention, but I think not as much, including in the economic journals, Robert, uh, in terms of understanding how this is a very different crisis. In terms of some things that I think are more generally new, I think Ricardo Caballero yesterday, I think summarized it in a nice way, which is this idea of the risk-centric view, that I think um, thinking in terms of where are the safe assets, who's looking for safety, who's looking for risk, that the allocation is very much in terms of distributing risk and not just distributing quantities, I think is a general heading for a way of thinking that I think more and more in macro and others we start having and that we didn't have 10 years ago. For instance, log linearizing models is not as much of a thing because you miss out on a lot of that and we're trying to do other things and this goes back to the technical difficulties that Nancy Stokey was talking about, but that I think is generally new and covers a lot of things and allows us to think about inequality and how people respond to their idiosyncratic risks, as well as aggregate risks and how they shift across sectors and across borders. And that I think is something that we've learned to think a lot more about second moments in risk and how they get allocated. Kristen? Jump in there. So back to when the Queen visited LSE. Um, <laughs> I've been starting to watch the Queen on Netflix, so I've gotten very into this. Um, so, something I couldn't do when I lived in the UK, because I guess that was not PC when you lived in the UK. But anyway, um, I guess after her visit, some professors at LSE wrote back and tried to explain why economists had missed the crisis, what had been missed in this. And the quote from that was that they said that what was missing was a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people to understand the risks to the system as a whole. And I think hope that's something that we've learned from this experience of the crisis, is to put risks together, to be more imaginative, look outside your narrow area of focus and think about interrelationships, spillovers, links between sectors, links between economies. Um, and let me just give three examples of areas where we actually had saw some risks, we had made progress, research had made progress, but we didn't take it that one extra step, which might have helped us at least fill in some of these important um, missing blocks that we missed before the crisis, that might have given us a better idea of what was morning. Uh, or what was coming. So here's three examples. Um, one was, there actually were a number of people who warned about problems in the housing market before the crisis. Um, Ed Gramlich on the Fed board was, was very vocal in warning about the risks. Uh, Greg Mankiw, who is chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House when I was there, was quite aggressive in trying to meet with people and very concerned about problems in Fannie and Freddie and trying to address some of the overlending and subprime risks. Um, there's some discussion that Greenspan might have even had some inklings of some of the risks in the housing sector. But where people lacked this creative imagination was how problems in the housing sector would then spill over more broadly and affect the core of the financial system. So we saw a piece but couldn't expand it outside that sector. 
Um, another area where there had been some good progress, but not quite enough, was there'd been a lot of very good academic work on contagion. A number of people in this room contributed to that. Um, after the, the Asian crisis did take economists by surprise. They didn't see how a crisis that started in Thailand could then spread to Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, and then Korea in a broader implications. That prompted a lot of great research on how crises spread, um, focusing on trade effects, competition in third markets, financial effects, some really nice work talking about how in third party intermediaries could spread contagion. Uh, for example, banks, um, building on Peking Rosengreen's work, how a crisis hits Thailand, banks with exposure to Thailand then reduce lending to Korea in order to rebuild balance sheets, and how financial centers can be intermediaries. Similarly, good work on uh, portfolio investors, how a, an investor takes a loss in Thailand, so they sell some of their investments in Korea to rebuild balance sheets or strengthen and balance sheets. So we had a good idea of how intermediaries could spread contagion, how contagion can happen, but we seemed to focus just on contagion from one country to another country. We didn't focus on what happens if those intermediaries have such a severe problem, they stop lending to everyone, and everyone contracts at the same time. So we almost got there, we were close, but that research didn't take that next step. Um, and one, a third area where we made some progress but didn't quite take it to that next level, was there was a lot of very good work in international economics on emerging markets. And especially after the Asian crisis, we had a pretty good storyline of how you have banks that maybe because of corruption or inefficient bad lending standards make a lot of bad loans, how that then combines with le leverage, a credit boom, and then how then when there's some sort of shock, how, badly, how that can bring down the whole system. We'd seen a story play out that wasn't that different than what happened in the US in emerging markets but we didn't have the foresight to think that could actually happen in a big country like the US, even though, again, we had a lot of the pieces there. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's actually quite amazing when you look back. There was enough awareness in the international policy community of these types of risks, so the World Bank and IMF started to do FSAPs, Financial Sector Assessment Programs, something like that, um, and, and look at financial systems, do a deep look at financial systems to see where there might be some of these risks from bad lending standards, or too much leverage, and some of these vulnerabilities we saw in the Asian crisis. And the US convinced everyone, oh, we don't need that. We're fine. Um, so we, there really was a lack of collective imagination to take these problems we had a good grasp of and think they could actually happen in the developed world. Um, so there, hopefully, that's something that we have learned now, to take this, push it a little more, think about how lessons we've seen in other countries could hit developed countries, think about connections between sectors, and just push things that one step further. I mean, just a really short comment to what Kristen just said. Um, the same is true for finance too, right? I mean, we've been beating up on macro a little bit, but if you think about in finance itself, um, I feel we had a very narrow view of where finan what financial markets are. Um, you know, I'm an economist by training. I came to Sloan and I was always stunned that everybody seems to focus in asset pricing on the one asset that's equity and how come, and obviously I'm, I'm not doing justice to the work of people like Daryl, Duffy and so on who have been studying you know, a much broader slice of our financial markets for a much longer time, but you know, suddenly issues like the housing market, like real estate, MBSs, I think we've, we overlooked them for a very long time and we thought because they're typically illiquid, they're boring. Um, and I feel this is also where within finance and hopefully helpful for macro, a lot of change has happened. That we are thinking about um, financial markets much more broadly, we're taking them much more seriously. Uh, and we're also taking um, the institutional aspects of them more seriously, right? I mean, if, if you look um, even at the, ver at the beginning when people started thinking about housing markets um, or thinking about banks, we still had a very boring view of what a bank is, right? We had the view as if a bank is an institution that holds risks. Um, but the financial sector had long moved to a model where they move risk, right? And so our models really only very recently caught up with where the financial sector already is. And I feel, you know, that's something where finance itself has to, to blame itself it, um, and not say, oh, this is, you know, kind of the failure of Marco of not translating us correctly. And so I think um, that is something where the financial crisis has jolted a lot of urgency and hopefully seriousness um, in what we do, and, and I think that's hopeful. I, add something, I want to add something slightly humorous so that 
I don't know. We we're being very serious in this panel relative to the previous <laughs> one. And so let me reply to something first Luigi Zingala said last panel, uh, where he kind of, I think, blamed macro in a way that uh, I'm going to blame finance instead for not reading enough macro, which is he said, look, we learned this thing, which is there's a lot of short-term debt. How are you guys not taking that into account or not? And we learned this in finance, say, in the last 10, 20 years and so on. We actually studied that problem in macro 50 years ago. I'm a little disappointed Robert Barrow didn't mention that. Um, because I learned it from him, but I think especially once he heard Bo call me a new Keynesian, I think he's reneged me completely. Um, <laughs> which is that, uh, which is the Friedman rule. That's what the Friedman rule is about. There was too little provision of public liquidity. And we studied it a lot on how is it that central banks are not issuing more reserves or more cash. As a result, we have too high interest rates. There's some substitution to private liquidity that comes with inefficiency. I'm looking at Bob Lucas who's worked a lot on this. Um, and so the Friedman rule is something that was fundamental in macro that we learned, and it was all about the absence of public supply of short-term debt, i.e. central bank money, if you want, um, and, that, and some of the costs were indeed the substitution of having too much of that. And that has informed, I think, very much policymakers insofar as the expansion of the balance sheet has been a response to that. I hope it's not going to be reverted to the point where we go back to the Friedman rule. I love the fact that we live in a floor system. The Friedman rule has been achieved, um, and that at least, I think, has helped ameliorate some of that. But that's, again, one part where macros have been talking about this for 50 years. Not, I'm not saying in any way that we're doing it completely the right way, and there isn't many ways to think about it, but we had thought a little bit about that problem, I think. Right, Robert? I think we had. I think I learned it from him. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree with what everyone or a number of us has said, is that we have made progress in bringing more finance into macro and more macro into finance. I think this is important. This is critical. We need to keep doing that. But what is still missing is bringing in the third component, which is the international side. And this has come up a bit over the last couple of days and came up in the last panel, too. And yes, I'm biased. I'm an international economist. Um, but I still think there, there are so many important lessons to learn from other countries outside the US, but still so much work focuses on the US. And yes, the data is easier. Um, but there are aspects of the US that make it special. We do need to focus on more. Um, and we could learn a lot. Like, I found it surprising. Uh, the last couple of days, we spent a lot of time on banking and banks and how banks work. But there was almost no discussion of international banking flows. And those are so important in these vulnerabilities that built up in many banks. Where did the money come from in many countries? It came from international capital flows. Um, here's some statistics. So uh, it, international capital flows increased quite starkly before the crisis to 16% of global GDP. Then they collapsed. They went negative as uh, countries around the world withdrew capital, especially as global Global banks withdrew foreign lending. Now, the, or a, a couple years ago, when I last looked at this data, they fell to about 1.6% of global GDP. 16% to 1.6. That's a massive contraction in cross-border capital flows. Most of that has been in bank flows. That's a fundamental change in how global banks are operating and channeling money around the world. And there's very little discussion of that in our models and in our discussion. Um, we really do need to think more, bring in more of these international sides, international components, what's going on internationally into our core models. It's not hard, it's not easy, but um, it is important. Should we take some questions, maybe? Mm -hmm. Can I say one thing oh, to sorry. what Kristen okay. was saying? Um, I, I very much agree with you, but I, even there, right? I mean, um, we see also a change in the data that we now have available, right? If you look at, you know, the ECB for the longest time didn't even make available for research um, the, say, target two data. And now we actually see um, accessibility and availability for two exactly those international flows. And we start thinking about the fact that um, say European banks are structured very differently, right? What in a US might be a within bank flow, um, in Europe will go through target two, through different divisions, and we can even then start understanding what is truly international, what is international but actually Deutsche Bank to Deutsche Bank, and those things obviously matter quite a bit. And so I feel um, the more we can encourage regulators, central banks to actually make that data available for broader study, um, you know, kind of that will really help that discussion. Because I still believe, you know, we are ultimately an empirical um, science in the sense that we need to be relevant for empirical decisions. And so this usually stimulates a lot of useful research, right, when we, we can actually see facts. Great. Okay. I think the acoustics are such that if you speak loudly, you can ask a question without a microphone, but we have one somewhere should you want one. So anyone who wants to comment or... Yes, John. Uh, and helps 
raise the question, what should we be paying attention to now? But we're not. We've spent 10 years and two and a half days laser-like focus on what happened in the US, and we're ready to hit a housing banking crisis when that comes. What are we not paying attention to? Ken Rogoff gave us a suggestion. What happens if there's a sovereign debt crisis in the advanced world? Something he told us we're pretty close to. If you just start thinking of the disaster when the firehouse had burned down, the lender of last resort is bankrupt. The stimulator and, and the other of last resort is gone. It just boggles the mind. Are we writing any papers on this? Any, any analysis? Any preparation? No. Uh, Annette brought up a cyber attack. She just got to the point of what happens when the credit cards all go dark. Let's take the next five steps after that. What is it, we're missing? What is it when Luigi will come back to us uh, 10 years from now and say, you bloody morons, you weren't paying attention. <laughs> I mean, I'll take a, a stab at that, and it's related to something I said earlier, and maybe gives me expand, a chance to expand upon it. But, you know, I do think that we, I completely agree with John in the sense that, you know, there's these cyclical factors and these crises, but I think that's a symptom of a deeper issue. And, you know, maybe I have a more pessimistic approach to life, so maybe I would call it a deeper problem. Uh, and I do relate it back to these secular trends that, you know, I'm, maybe I'm channeling a bit of my inner Larry Summers here with his secular stagnation point. But I, I do think that I've been, I've been surprised at, that we haven't taken these kinds of ideas more seriously, that there does seem like something is going on in especially advanced economies that then spills over into emerging economies over the last 30 years. And again, just to repeat those facts, I mean, you look at the Alan Taylor picture of what's happened to mortgage debt, to income levels throughout the advanced world. You look at what's happening with house prices in London, in Stockholm, in Vancouver. There seems like there's some issue going on about the financial system. So I would ask a very basic question, which is what is the financial system doing? In a very fundamental sense, that's one of the beautiful things about our macroeconomist colleagues, is they ask very fundamental questions. What is it doing? If you start to look at bank balance sheets, you realize that a huge fraction of it is real estate lending. Okay, and Alan Taylor showed that, actually much more real estate lending than non-real estate lending. Why is that? Why do we allow an institution that's basically taking bets on real estate to issue short-term deposit-like claims? It doesn't sound like the kind of information insensitive business loans that we traditionally had. So I think we really need to take a, take a look more fundamentally at what the financial sector is doing, what value does it add, um, and exactly what, you know, why we have so much government regulation and frankly government support of the financial sector. Can I follow on up on this? So, um, if you look actually in the US, that question also interacts with the question about how government regulation functions, right? I mean, actually banks are not holding right now a lot of the housing risk because it's securitized through the GSEs, which means through all of us. My worry is actually if something happens in the US housing market, we're not going to see it as an immediate housing crisis, but we might see it as a protected, we are bailing out that system and bailing out the GSEs through our tax money and through you know, stagnation and low, um, and low growth. Um, so um, that's exactly, I think, an area, and maybe that's where you were going, John, that maybe we're not thinking broadly enough what are the regulations that we have in place and how they affect financial markets broadly. I feel they are actually a concept that um, my colleague Bob Merton always brings up, which is that you know there are a lot, there are certain financial functions that in any every economy have to be fulfilled, like insurance, uh, so risk risk sharing, um, uh, moving financial claims across time, right, um, borrowing. Um, those, t those type of function every economy would like to fill. Um, and we often only see when some function goes bad, but we don't see the under provision. That's what I was trying to say before, right? Um, when people don't have enough access to credit. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, this was also something that was very interesting in the discussion between, say, Raghu, um, um, and Gary Gorton, right, which is, it's true that short-term debt leads to fragility, but actually debt is also in many countries the only claim you have, because equity is an invitation to lying, right? So if, if you don't have and misstating, and so 
um, in developing countries, that's often the only way you can actually transfer um, money from somebody with, with, uh, with wealth but no good ideas to somebody else, right? And in this trade-off of um, should we forego the potential growth opportunities, um, even at the risk of some instability, is something that, you know, kind of should be more central in our mind, not just, you know, let's shut down the, the worry about crises. Okay, yes. Um, so let me answer, just two slight answers, John, which is the first one is, I mean, I am thinking, for instance, as you know, because you discussed this paper not that long ago on, well, what happens if we have to inflate the debt? Can that happen or not? So we think about it a little. And moreover, I mean, in Europe, there is a lot of thought in terms of how to create safe assets. What happens if Italy leaves the euro? What happens if Portugal defaults on its public debt? So there is some attempts at at least some of what these tail events can seem may be. Having said that, there's just so many of them. And insofar as we have become more data disciplined, we don't have data on these tail events that will allow us to discipline our theories. But I could not, but that I agree with Kristen when she said, I think quoting the Queen, that there, is, there may be a failure of collective imagination. Quoting me, LSE. LSE, okay. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, you know, boy, you know, macro people get such a hard time whenever we go on our theoretical tangents. Uh, and now you want me to go my on other some macro, more. My other macro, macro people, exactly. <laughs> but let me, let me, but I'm, a, I'm much more of an optimist in some way, so let me tell you kind of a little bit of a tangent story or a, a tangent a little bit on how kind of sometimes I agree with you that we tend to often focus too much on the last crisis, but some tangents in which you can affect things. I mean, I think it was a net dimension that in some ways I could say, well, this financial crisis, let's focus on inequality because ultimately inequality is a big part of what perhaps even drives some of the borrowing and others and so on. As a response to the crisis, I mean, um, Veronica Guerrieri and Guido Lorenzoni sitting there said, well, we need to kind of understand the zero lower bound. And they said, well, I need to understand the aggregate demand, but we have these shocks to real interest rates, so I better have both some model of aggregate demand, new Keynesian, sorry, Robert, um, and at the same time have some incomplete insurance conjugate inequality. And they wrote a model that kind of merged um, the new Keynesian model with what was then the standard complete markets model. I know this well because at exactly the same time I was writing a model on that too uh, for a different question because I was trying to understand, well, there's been this fiscal response to what extent so much of the fiscal response was that some people get transferred, some don't. I needed to understand the new Keynesian multipliers of this. I needed to have inequality on it. Right? So we started there. We weren't in terms of that stuff. We wrote our papers, I think, almost at the same time. But we're kind of doing very similar things, merging this, the incomplete markets model with the new Keynesian model. You know, that was just six years ago, maybe seven. Um, six years later, Nancy Stoke was describing this models have been rebaptized Hank, heterogeneous agent new Keynesian models. They're an enormous growth. Um, now people are using these ideas that me, Alistair McKay, and, um, and Veronica and Guido have to now think about how do we put banks when there's a lot of heterogeneity, how do we think about monetary policy in them, and so on. And so, you know, at least on that inequality, yeah, we did think about it in tortuous ways. I think we weren't thinking so much about the financial crisis. We did write some models. They're really taking off. We're starting to put banks in them. They have inequality. They have what and what wanted. So, you know, looking at the tree, I mean, there are, there are some places, there are Quite a few places in macro when one way, in some ways or others we have addressed at least some of the topics and you know if this was not a macro finance but macro public finance I would, we were shy at six years ago on why we didn't we only had representative agents we've done the inequality we've avoided that one now you know if i go to conferences like what about the cyber tax now i'm trying to catch up but um, but at least there's some optimism there's some response <laughs> So, so, John, I, have, I agree people should be thinking about we are going to get a shock, we are going to have a surprise. The obvious solution is we need to build resilience, reduce the amplification mechanism, so whatever that shock hits, it doesn't spread the way the last crisis did. So I talked about a lot of that in my opening comments. I won't repeat all that. But where I think we haven't talked enough about is how we actually make that happen. Let's say we can agree on some of the key steps on how we do macroprudential regulation, reduce systemic risk, reduce amplification. Let's say we could even, we as economists could agree, you know, big if clearly, but if we could, we need to have institutions that will then follow through and make those difficult changes happen. Um, that means political institutions that are, I think Raghu had a great quote yes, yesterday or the day before, where he said, we all talk about how we should take away the punch bowl, but in practice what we actually do is pick up the pieces. We need to find some way to create institutions that will let us take away the punch bowl more. Um, and, and that's where I, I am also quite worried. Um, if you look at what has come out of the crisis, we now have a better sense of some things we need to do. 
do. Say so one, just to be concrete, one macroprudential regulation there's pretty solid agreement on is the benefits of a CCYB, a countercyclical capital buffer. It seems pretty straightforward. When times are good, credit is expanding, we should raise the capital requirements in banks. When things deteriorate, you ease it. It's pretty techy. That should be pretty straightforward to do. There's actually been some good technical work at the BIS and other groups on where numbers should be. So I think if there's anything close to a consensus, that's one I think there's pretty good agreement on that makes sense. Good academic work where it needs to go. The academic work says it needs to be used quite a bit more actively. Right now, there's only, my last count, eight countries that have actually implemented it, and most of them have put it up by a tiny amount. There's been very little progress on what seems like one of the simplest, most straightforward, most agreed upon responses. So it's clearly hard to do some of this stuff. Why is a, if you're political, why should you make it harder to, to get access to credit for housing? Uh, why should you reduce access to credit um, for a risk that might happen out in the future 10 years from now when you're not in office? Those are hard things to do. So I think we do need to think seriously about creating institutions that have some political independence that can make these tough decisions, but also at the same time have political support, because some of these measures, they're not quite as independent as central banking. They do affect people in a more direct way. So I don't think you can completely offsource them to some technocrats in an ivory institution that no one interacts with. You do need some more engagement, but you still need to give these institutions enough political independence to make the tough choices. And that's where I think um, was particularly helpful. It's been nice work by um, Luigi and Rajan on some of the plot politics of creating these institutions, and also the historical work by Barry Eichen Green, I think is very nice on why some countries had the fetters of the gold standard and stuck with it despite some of the economic costs and consequences. So that's an area there are some people working on, but I'd like to see more work on to get at some of these problems. All right, we have many more questions than we have time for it. So John Janakopoulos had his hand up first, so that's how we'll decide who gets to ask the last question of the day. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment, in fact, um, that ties together some of the things some of you said about having more data and uh, so on. So what we have, the problem we have is the problem of debt uh, as opposed to equity. And the mistake made that was made many years ago, which we've begun to correct, is that when you're talking about debt, you have to think about default. Um, and that was not emphasized enough in the old, old style macroeconomics. We have default, uh, as uh, Antoinette has made clear. There are many different dimensions which lenders look at. They look at loan to value, leverage. They look at debt to income. They look at FICO or, or credit rating. So wouldn't it be good if we had some central body like the Federal Reserve keeping track for all the big asset classes like mortgages, what is the credit? So as a function, sorry, of each of these dimensions, you get a market clearing interest rate. I call it the credit service. So would it be good if there was some body that collected all the data and every quarter told us in the mortgage world, what does the credit service look like? What are the loans being given as a function of LTV and of, of uh, FICO and so on? And in corporate Conway, what does that credit surface look like? And in the consumer lending world, the unsecuritized consumer lending world, what does that credit surface look like? I think it would give the whole economy a lot more information because what we would find is that at some time, the credit <coughs> surface was very flat. You could expand, you could be a much more dangerous borrower and get almost the same interest rate. At other times, it would be very steep. It would be very hard to get credit if you weren't a perfect borrower. So that would give us a clue as to how easy credit was and where it was. And we would find, as Antoinette said, that at the current time, because of the action of the last crisis, if you're an average of with an average of FICO score, very difficult to get a mortgage. And so the, the Federal Reserve would recognize the sources of inequality, but also because some people weren't access to loans, or put it another way, some people who need loans have to pay a much higher interest rate. That causes a lot of inequality. But it would give us a hint as to how easy credit was and why the economy was slowing and why the economy was speeding up. And in fact, I think all central banks actually think this way. They just don't talk that way. So if we could get them to talk in terms of the whole credit surface, when they lower the risk of interest rate, they're really trying to affect some risky interest rate. Why don't they tell us we're lowering the interest rate so bad in the mortgage market we can affect 
interest rates on those LPPs are so that uh, in the corporate model, <coughs> these kinds of people can get these loans. I think it would make the discussion of what the central banks were doing much clearer and would also allow us to test whether they were accomplishing what they intended to do and tell us what their plans were. Yes, okay. I think the whole panel. Wait, Antoinette, oh. do you want to start and we'll just go to the. I I can start, but um, so I like this idea a lot, right? We should have a much broader sense of how um, cost of credit, not just as a mean, but how it looks as a distribution. But, you know, I've, I've had this discussion with you before, John, but um, then we shouldn't stop there because what we've also learned, and actually we've known this as economists for a long time, right, is that financial markets don't just work through pricing risk, but rationing it. And so we need to, you know, have the, the volume dimension together with, you know, kind of the pricing dimension because there might be many risks that are right now um, just not priceable and rationed out. And if you miss that, right, you might think it's right now a very flat surface because risks, you know, there's not a lot of risk in the economy, um, but a lot of people have been rationed out. And we've seen this, for example, in interbank markets, I think um, Gary would say in repo markets in a way, right, um, that those things matter quite a bit. I was just going to say, I think the data exists, actually. The Federal Reserve Bank Consumer Credit Panel in the U.S., for example, pretty much you can get almost everything you just said. Uh, they try to package it in a way that makes it pretty easily digestible, but I think one of your points would be perhaps it should be more visible as, as, visible as say, the Fed funds rate um, on at least mortgages. On other asset classes, it's a harder number to get. And I would say also that, you know, there is progress on this. For example, Atif and I are doing a project on the Bank of Korea, which regularly uses the LTV ratio and the debt to income ratio on mortgages as a tool to basically deal with the, the housing market. Um, the Bank of Israel does something similar. The UK does something similar. The Ricks Bank itself basically put on, I think, what is it like? You have to pay back higher amortization if you're above some level. In fact, it's so easy that this morning I can tell you in, the, in Sweden what it is, right? So the, the average new mortgage in Sweden has an LTV ratio of 65%, which for US standards is quite low, actually. So it made me more confident, as Lars was saying, that there's not an cr imminent crash. Uh, and I I think the debt to income level, that's balance of income over, I think, annual income is about 600 six, uh, percent, so six, six times income uh, in the housing market. So the data are definitely out there. Maybe we should make them more visible so that people can really focus on them more. Yes. Just to some more questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. More data is always well, good. Yeah. <laughs> we promised to stop by 1145, and so we're going to have to have the rest of this conversation in smaller groups. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you especially to the panelists. Thank you.